Well, um, good to see you guys tonight. We are looking at justification part due tonight and uh, continuing our discussion of this doctrine, this topic of justification. Um, if, if you have your notes in front of you, you probably saw this in the email if you already printed it out. Um, what you have with your notes is just the pretty much the continuation of what we had from, from last time. So you, you, you notice, I'm sure, that from last time um, we didn't uh, finish the entire subject. Uh, the notes didn't show that completed. So these notes are intended to complete uh, the rest of the subject. And you probably saw in the email just how much we're planning on covering tonight. Uh, we're going to look at things like what did Roman, uh, what, what did the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation believe? We're going to look at something called the New Perspective on Paul. Raise your hand if you've heard something about the New Perspective on Paul. We're going to talk about how do we deal with the supposed contradiction between James and Paul. Okay, Paul says we're justified by faith apart from works. James says we're justified not by faith alone, but by works. Is there a contradiction here? We're going to talk about that uh, tonight. And then all the while, we're going to talk about imputation. Uh, that's going to be the thread that weaves everything together. Let's pray, and then we'll do some review from last time, and then get into our subject for tonight. All right, so <clears throat> this was, uh, as usual, the direction that... Um, we said we were going to go, and as we've been going with respect to all the other doctrines, uh, whether it was election or union with Christ or whatever, we're all just kind of trying to do this introduction to the doctrine, an exposition of it, and then applications. And uh, we got through all of the introduction from last time. We got basically halfway through our exposition from last time. So our goal is to finish that up and then, of course, to do some applications during our time. Just to review a little bit from last time, um, we look, looked at some definitions of justification. You remember this one from Wayne Grudem. Uh, Wayne Grudem says, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God. Uh, and we noticed um, about this definition, just this idea that it's instantaneous. This is not a process, okay? This is a, at a single moment, uh, a, and this was the big word um, also that we looked at, it's a legal act of God. We're talking about a courtroom scene, basically. And we'll revisit that here in a little bit. It's a legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven, okay, and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. Um, and then, number two, declares us to be righteous in his sight. Very good definition that incorporates uh, the ideas of our forgiveness of sins and that because our sins have been placed on Christ at the cross and then his righteous life has been given to us. Notice that Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. That is uh, what we're going to talk particularly about tonight, this idea of imputation. Um, Grudem doesn't mention imputation here, but that's what he's talking about with respect to Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. Uh, and then, of course, the second thing, declaring us to be righteous in his sight. So justification is a declaration, right? It's God declaring something about us. Yes? Okay. And then we noticed also from MacArthur and Mayhew's definition, uh, again, this idea, it's an instantaneous act of God, uh, whereby as a gift of his grace... He imputes, there's that idea, to a believing sinner the full and perfect righteousness of Christ through faith alone and legally, there's that word legal, declares him perfectly righteous in his sight, forgiving the sinner of all unrighteousness and thus delivering him from all condemnation. Keep this idea of condemnation in mind. The opposite of justification is condemnation. And we can substantiate that from Scripture which is what we're going to do tonight when we look at Romans 5, okay? Now, um, we kind of, we, not kind of, we did call this a, a, a definition, but 
Um, do you remember what word I used for this instead of a definition? I know it's definition up here, but an explanation is what I, what I tried to call it last week. So instead of this being a tight maybe definition, I said this is an explanation of what justification is. Um, and I'm not going to read that because I'm going to read it in, in just a second um, when, we, when we get into um, imputation. As we um, made our way into the exposition from last time, we looked at two key passages from justification. We looked at Luke 18, remember that? The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And then we also looked at Romans 3, 21 through 26. Okay, And with respect to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18, um, that's a parable in which is affirmed the response of the tax collector. We uh, read there Luke 18, 13 through 14, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Um, who is this tax collector relying upon ultimately? It's God and God's what in particular? God's mercy, yes. And uh, verse 14, uh, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. And the other in this case is the, the Pharisee in the parable. Uh, the key word that we looked at here was the word justified. And we um, looked at the Greek word uh, dikaio, which means to render a favorable verdict. Uh, the word has to do with the law court of heaven. In this case, uh, the law court of heaven. It's about God's declaring over someone a favorable verdict of not guilty, not condemned. And that was the case of the tax collector here in Luke 18. That's what he's being declared to be in a favorable state. We also noted that the declaration of this tax tax collector was not based on anything he did. Notice there's nothing in these verses that, that speak about him doing any kind of works, right? There's no works of his own involved in this. It's a complete reliance upon the mercy of God. And, and we noted this, that um, this declaration was an instant because this man, what? Went down to his house justified. Okay, uh, he, he didn't have to go perform works, right, to be justified. But he, was, he went to his house with this declaration over his life as justified. You see that? This supports this idea of it being uh, instantaneous, not a part of um, some process of him performing good works. Uh, it's an instant. Of course, that fits in also with the, just the analogy itself of, the declaration of a judge over the life of somebody not guilty. That's a verdict that's pronounced in a moment. And then you guys remember this passage from last time. I'm not going to read it all, but I do want to note just uh, four things in particular um, that are, I think, worth noting. And this really supports that idea that the Reformers had of the solas of the Reformation. Remember, we said... What about this? Who are the law and the prophets? What's that a, a shorthand for? Or another way to, to, to describe something? The Old Testament scriptures, right, exactly. So we said about justification that it is, it is what? Scripture alone, okay? And we also notice that this righteousness that comes from God is through what? It's through faith. So what do we have here? Faith alone. And this faith is in who? Christ. Okay. And notice here, we are justified by His grace. What is this? Grace alone. Of course, you can see here the repeated ideas of faith, right? Faith in Jesus, so Christ alone, in Christ Jesus. You see where the reformers get these ideas from? I mean, this passage in particular is just chock full of these ideas that we are justified 
in accordance with Scripture alone, um, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by the grace of God alone, and of course we're missing what? To the glory of God alone. But if you just kind of look over at Romans 11, verse 36, then you see there, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And, and included in the all things there is certainly justification. God justifies his people for his own glory. So um, while it's not in this passage to the glory of God alone, it's certainly something that Paul says later on in his letter. Um, really kind of neat, right? Uh, it's awesome when you, when you see these kind of things just very clearly uh, in Scripture, and it's not just some kind of tradition that you've believed. But this is, in fact, the Word of God. We're justified in accordance with the Scripture alone, um, through faith alone, in Christ alone, um, and that is uh, by God's grace alone. All right? So we pretty much finished up um, looking at those kind of things from last week, and um, we, we now turn the corner. Like I said, what we're going to do is focus in particular on this idea of imputation. Uh, we said in our explanation of justification that through faith in Jesus Christ and his redeeming, atoning work on the cross, Jesus absorbed God's wrath on the cross and perfectly obeyed God's law so that his righteousness would be imputed to the believing sinner. So it would be imputed to the believing sinner. And this idea of imputation says that the righteous life of Christ is imputed to or credited to our account by faith alone. Uh, he lived a perfect life and especially died as a perfect substitute. We would affirm that, right? Was Jesus a perfect substitute on the cross? Of course he was. Amen. And we're going to look at that even in more depth this evening. And, and that record is counted, his record of righteousness is counted as our record through faith. Um, amen. Glory to God. What remains to be discovered is where and how the scripture teaches this doctrine. Where can we point to in the New Testament? And how does the scripture talk about this doctrine? We're going to look at that today. Now, before we do that, we want to deal just with the historical controversy. Because in terms of the providence of God, Jinx Bible Church and other faithful Protestant churches out there are in existence today because something happened in the 1500s. Okay? Something just monumental happened in the 1500s, and it was the rediscovery of the gospel, and in particular, this idea of imputation, okay? Uh, what the Bible says about the imputed righteousness of Christ was at the very heart of what was the controversy between the Reformers and then the Roman Catholic Church at that time, okay? So um, as a just kind of a heading for this, what we're going to talk about briefly, the Protestant reformers, and that would be Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, etc., believe that the scripture teaches the idea that when a sinner exercises uh, faith in Jesus Christ, that is, they put their trust in the person and work of Christ, God imputes to the believer a righteousness that is foreign to him. A righteousness that is foreign to him. And of course, um, I've said this on multiple occasions already, but whose righteousness is imputed to us? It's Christ, and that's what the Reformers uncovered or recovered, was the idea of Christ's righteousness being imputed to us. And um, there's, a, there's a big word here that you may have heard before, and you may just want to write this off to the side, but it's this, this, this idea of forensic, okay? It's, it's, it's a forensic righteousness. Um, it's a foreign righteousness to us. In other words, it's not a righteousness that we have, like that we've accomplished. Uh, it's outside of us. And in particular, it's outside of us in the person and in the work of Christ. So just hold on to that idea of forensic. And, um, and of course, we, when you read uh, about the controversy where you read different books about the imputed righteousness of Christ, and you see the word forensic, you'd be like, oh, yeah, man, Pastor Matt talked to me about the word forensic. I remember that, a big word he used. This was the, this was the controversy. And what happened um, as a result of the controversy 
um, and, and the recovery of, of this imputation, this doctrine of imputation, was um, what's called a counter-reformation. So um, the reformers had their reformation, but then the, the Catholics, they came back and countered the reformation. Have you, have you guys heard of the counter-reformation? Okay. Um, one place you could look is in the Council of Trent, and I put that in your notes. That was a council that was convened to um, counter what the claims were that the reformers were making with respect in particular in the case that we're going to look at with the idea of imputation. And this is how the Roman Catholics, and by the way, even to this day, um, this is still the teaching um, of, of, of Roman Catholicism, all right? And so here's what we read in one of the canons uh, in the Council of Trent, okay? Canon 9 says that if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, who, who are they talking about here? Well, they're talking about the reformers, right? So if any, if any, if any person, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, well, that's what the, the reformers are saying, okay? Meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. That's how strong a response the Roman Catholic Church had to the Protestant Reformation, and in particular, the doctrine of imputation. If you were to, um, if you were to kind of think about a, um, just an extrapolation or an implication of what Rome believe about just, believed about justification, how might you articulate that from this definition. Let me ask that differently. Um, obviously, they rejected the idea of justification by faith alone or imputation by faith alone. Okay. W what do they add to justification? If, if someone's going to be truly justified, what do they have to do? Works. Works. They have to cooperate with God, right? Notice the word cooperation. You guys heard of the word synergism before? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a work of both God and man. So the Roman Catholic Church is saying that, yes, it, it's, it's, it's grace, but it's grace that's infused in us that produces works, and those works justify us. It's not by faith alone. It's by works, okay? All right, here's another thing right here. Do you guys see that, by the, by the way, from, from just this saying right here? They're saying it, it, it's, it's not an imputation um, by faith alone. There's a cooperation here in order to, and of course, this is a big word, obtain, okay? Meriting of the grace of justification. Reformers said, no, it's not a merit. It's um, completely by, by faith alone or not by works. Here's Canon 11. Uh, they said, if anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, and just just... They're using this synonymous to righteousness. The sole imputation of the justice or righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost and remains in them are also that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God. Notice again, let him be what? anathema damned, okay? That's how serious they were seeing what the reformers were saying about imputation. Hey, if you believe that imputation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, you are anathema. You are, are damned, okay? And um, even by this statement as well, we could see this idea of the infusion of grace that they believe in the charity which is poured forth in their hearts. In other words, the love that results um, in works is what they're, what they're hinting at here as the basis. So again, the basis of justification according to Roman Catholicism is charity, the good works that come from the, the infusion of God's grace in their lives. Okay. So this was... Um,
This was the teaching in the Council of Trent. And um, we could look at other places like the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, uh, within that document itself, which is part of the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, and the dogma, the doctrine of Roman Catholicism, is uh, a doctrine that opposes this idea of the free imputation of, of Christ's righteousness by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay? And just to summarize, Roman Catholicism teaches that one has grace infused in their lives by God, which produces good works, and those good works merit one's justification. Well, we're going to say that this is different, however, from what we see in the Bible. Um, and even though we could conclude just from a historical basis that the Reformers taught this idea of imputation, at the end of the day, our authority is not the Reformers, but our authority is the Scripture. Amen? Our authority is the Bible. We have to demonstrate this from the very words of God, that imputation is, in fact, true. And, of course, again, going back to this um, explanation, uh, we're saying that um, Christ's righteousness is imputed to uh, the believing sinner. And in our time, I want us to focus on this biblical position. And as a, a question to sort of lead out with as we get into the doctrine of imputation, uh, someone may say, uh, and you may be asked this, this question uh, at some point, or someone may say this to you, um, show me one verse on imputation and I'll believe it, okay? In other words, hey, just give me one verse on imputation or I, I, I won't believe it. Uh, well, that is an unfair expectation of a number of different doctrines in the Scripture. And in fact, as we turn to the Scripture, um, we don't have just one particular passage on imputation, but I'm going to refer to it as a constellation of different verses. Okay? So it's as we look at a number of different passages on imputation that we get the full picture of imputation. Does that make sense? Okay. There are, there are a number of verses, and in particular, um, there are three passages or three verses that you could point to, and we're going to look at those three verses in our time to, uh, together. And um, other authors have, have also concluded that these three verses are key. So you've got Romans 4, okay? And, and in particular, you, you'll notice down there in a the footnote, Romans 4, 3, Romans 5, 19, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Those are key verses um, that are part of this constellation uh, of the full picture of imputation. Having said that, there are some other verses that we're going to look at as well. So it's not just those three verses. Other verses are significant to the discussion as well. Okay, we're on the same page? We good? Okay, let's uh, move on to our first passage. Then this is Romans 4. Uh, coming right after that passage we looked at from last week where Paul uh, developed the doctrine of justification. Now he starts to dip into some aspects of imputation. Let me read these verses and we'll talk about them. Uh, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Okay? So the first thing I want to say from these verses is that God counts sinners righteous by faith. Notice that the, the, the reference here to this Old Testament passage, Paul points out that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And at the end of verse 5, expanding that to everybody, um, we are all uh, counted as righteous according to what? According to faith. According to faith. His faith is counted as righteousness. So notice here very clearly just the idea that God counts to people 
or reckons to people that they get his declaration of righteousness based on faith. And then as we consider that even more, Paul develops it and says that this justification is not by works, right? Very clearly, Paul says, and to the one who does not work, this is uh, an indication that justification does not come through works. It's not a wage that we earn. We don't, we don't get compensated for our works and justification. It is by faith um, and not by works. And then finally, uh, we can see that justification involves the justification of believing sinners. Um, God justifies the ungodly person who exercises uh, faith, who believes in him, as God is the one who justifies the ungodly. So um, just to surface this now, we'll talk about it more later, but does, jo- does God justify the godly? No, it's the ungodly. So he's not, he's not pronouncing ju- justification on people who've demonstrated good works. You see that? That's not, what, that, that's not what's involved here. Um, it is the prerequ- prerequisite of ungodliness or being a sinner who then believes in Christ that one has this declaration of righteousness. Any, any thoughts or questions on this passage right here? Kind of zip through that pretty quick. Hopefully those things are pretty clear from the text. All right. Let's take a look at Romans 5. Um, Obviously, the next chapter, Paul uh, picks up in this chapter in verses 18 through 19 on the issue of justification. He says, Therefore, is one trespass led to condemnation for all men? By the way, Who's the one trespass referring to right here? Adam. Adam's sin, right? So this is Adam's sin. And it led to what? It led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Just go ahead and note, there's the parallel that's being drawn. Condemnation versus justification. Okay, those are two, those two are opposite. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Uh, Does anybody remember the big phrase that we used for what's going on here? Uh, Not not imputation, don't don't go there yet. But it was, what's that? Now that's a big phrase. Um, and that was definitely seen in Romans 3, and that is a big word. That's right. We, we really um, spent a lot of time on that. Um, it, it rhymes with uh, shmorperit holidarity. Y'all remember the, the phrase? Ben? <laughs> yes. Ben, let's go. Ben. Loving it. Corporate solidarity. You like my hints, right? I'm working on it. Lord, help me give better hints. And uh, he, he shows up. Corporate solidarity. That's right. That's the word that we uh, even talked about in our first uh, class together. And uh, corporate solidarity is the idea that one person acts on behalf of a group of people. Okay, One person acts and then a whole bunch of other people, a part of a group, are affected by that. Remember Achan's sin? Right? Achan sinned in the Old Testament and, and Israel was implicated in that sin. The consequences for Achan's sin fell on the people at large. Uh, well, in this case right here, we, we have that same idea that Adam acts and his actions affect the whole of the human race. Christ acts and those who are represented by him, they receive his actions. They receive the results of his actions. Um, you guys probably remember this really excellent quote for Doug, from Doug Moo, who said that this notion of corporate solidarity, which is rooted in the Old Testament, I just gave that example about Aiken, um, held that actions of certain individuals could have a representative character being regarded as, in some sense, the actions of many other individuals at the same time. I think there is that there is good reason to support that Paul adopted such a concept as a fruitful way of explaining the significance and salvation history of both Adam and Christ. 
For Paul, Adam, like Christ, was both a historical figure and a corporate figure whose sin could be regarded at the same time as the sin of all his descendants. Does that make sense? When Adam sinned, we're all implicated in that sin so that the judgment that fell on him falls on all of us. And according to, and according to Paul, what's the, what's the judgment that falls on us? According to verse 18. It leads to what? Condemnation. We're all condemned because of Adam's sin. Right? Now people have said, well, that's not fair. Well, I, I didn't do it. He did it. Well, well, do we want to apply the same thing then to, to Christ? If you're a Christian, Christ did it all for you. You get implicated in his actions, okay? So at the end of the day, none of us really wants fairness, right? We don't want ju- judgment. We don't want justice. We want mercy, right? And the only way to get mercy is, is if it's found in Christ. It's, it's in Christ and in Christ alone. Um, another thing we could just kind of wax um, extensively on in our day is this idea that, that Adam was a historical figure. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. I just want to point it out because you're, you're going to hear from a lot of evolutionary, uh, maybe theistic evolutionists that Adam was not a, a, a literal historical figure, that he was sort of the, um, he was plucked up from the um, bipedal primates of the evolutionary process and God just took one of those homo sapiens and made it a oh this is adam right here um or or they'll or they'll just deny that adam was a figure at all he's just kind of made up you guys heard this before okay yeah don't don't believe that okay the bible presents very clearly adam was a historical figure and in fact what kind of problem do you have if you go to romans 5 and adam is fake who else is fake christ is fake exactly um and we're not going to go there are we we don't want to go there um, so if we're going to believe that Christ was a real historical figure, which he most definitely was, we have to believe the same about Adam. Real historical figure, an individual created directly by God himself. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Just a minute and 45 seconds. That's all, that's, that's all that was. Okay, so anything about corporate solidarity, does that make sense? We, I know we're rehearsing something that we've already talked about before, but it's very, very significant to just get that in your thinking as to what it is that Paul is doing Adam acting on behalf of the entire human race, and then of course Christ acting on behalf of those who are united to Him by faith. Right? Um, justification, notice, is also based on the one act of righteousness. And uh, what, what do you guys think is the one act of righteousness that's being referred to here? Jesus dying on the cross. That's exactly right. That was a righteous act. Philippians two, right? He humbled himself by becoming what? Obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That, that's what's being particularly referenced right here, the one act. Okay, so we noted that it's just the one act of Jesus, his uh, righteous act of obedience. And in particular, we would, we would point to that being the cross. Um, here's the third uh, star in the constellation of imputation. It's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. How many of you are decently familiar with this passage right here? Yeah, this is a very key passage right here on imputation. Uh, Let me read it. We'll talk about it. Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the first thing to look at is that God looked at the sacrifice of Jesus as a sin substitute for his people. God looked at the sacrifice of Jesus as a sin substitute for his people. The text says he made him to be sin. Okay, He made him to be sin is is pointing to God making Jesus in his sacrifice a sin substitute for his people. Just to develop this a little bit more, um, we could say that, that Jesus died in the place of sinners being the sacrifice that God required to absorb the penalty of sin. Uh, the penalty of sin. And this idea of a sin substitute comes from the Old Testament. It's rooted very deeply in the sacrificial system, in particular, of the Old Testament. So, under the Old Covenant, you, you had the sacrificial system based on 
the temple, and Moses was commanded to build a temple at the center of uh, that temple, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, was called to build, yes, a temple at the center of really what was Jerusalem, um, would eventually be Jerusalem, uh, was a, and in that in that temple, the center of it was a room called the what? What was the the center of that temple? Holy of Holies, right? Um, you increasingly the closer you got to that, the more it was just increased in terms of the presence of God. And and in that room, you had what? The Ark of the Covenant, right? And um, the high priest on the Day of Atonement would bring into that Holy of Holies what? A, a sacrifice, right? He'd bring that, that, um, that spotless sacrifice, the blood of it, uh, into the temple, and he would sprinkle it over what? Yeah, the mercy seat. So, so this right here, um, just to refresh us, was the, the mercy seat, okay? And, and of course, in this box right here was, were, were some items, what was one of the items that was placed in the uh, in that box? You had the Ten Commandments. That's right. You had the Ten Commandments, and then you've got these these uh, angels right on either side. Uh, the cherubim. That's right, with the wings facing uh, toward each other. And um, it's supposed that the the Ark of the Covenant is a reflection, because remember Moses was to make this after the pattern of what what he saw in heaven. And the idea is that God in heaven, he has what around him? Cherubim, right? And um, underneath him is, is the earth. And of course, on the earth are sinful people who have broken what? His Ten Commandments. And so this whole ark right here was a picture of just the cosmic reality. Okay, It was envisioned God's in between these cherubim. He looks down and sees the Ten Commandments that we've broken. Okay, so God has to have something come in between his holiness and then sinful people. And it has to be what? It has to, well, ultimately has to be Christ. And, and, and this is a prefigurement of that. It's blood. It's that which is a substitute between God and sinful humans, a covering. And that's why the, 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 the priest would come in and sprinkle that on, on the mercy seat. That's, that's the sacrifice that was a substitute for people's sins. That makes sense? And that's what, that's what the New Testament pick, is picking up. And, of course, is saying that Jesus is the one uh, who ultimately is the fulfillment of this sin substitute, this blood uh, sacrifice. Isn't that awesome, just how the Scripture just comes together? Um, it's just so, so beautiful. Um, the author of Hebrews says, um, it's not by the blood of bulls and goats, that we could be remitted of our sins, right? All that was a prefigurement of the ultimate sacrifice of, of Christ uh, himself, okay? So this idea, again, of, of, of the blood being um, sprinkled on the mercy seat uh, from a sin substitute, uh, that's what Jesus was, and uh, the text says God made him to be that sacrifice. He's the one that comes between a holy God and sinful humans who have broken his law. All right? It's beautiful. Um, so, so God looks at Jesus as if he committed all the sins of his people. But then, then Paul adds the words here about Jesus not knowing sin, and this is extremely significant. This is not obviously something to just brush over. Um, Jesus was perfect in his character, never deviating from the righteous requirements of law. Notice it was him who knew no sin, okay? So, so God makes the, the, the sin substitute um, to be sin, but the, the, the important point is that he is one who's never committed sin. And, and that's, what, that's what's indicated by the word no. This isn't about intellectual facts. Did Jesus know that there was sin in the world? Of course he did. But he never, and this is the key how Paul's using knew here, is he never experienced it personally. He never committed any sin of himself. He is the perfect sacrifice, uh, the sinless, spotless sacrifice for sins. You can note some verses in the New Testament. Remember John the Baptist said uh, this about Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God. 
who takes away the sin of the world. Um, This is not insignificant, calling him the Lamb of God. The Old Testament sacrifice had to be a perfect spotless lamb, and therefore that's what John is indicating. This, this one who is going to take away the sin of the world, well, he's the, he's the perfect, spotless lamb. Right? Another verse from the author of Hebrews teaching the same about Jesus. Sinlessness, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. He's been tempted as we are as humans. Um, Think about the Matthew 4 passage and all the temptations that Jesus faced there in the wilderness by the devil. He succeeded in every one of them. That's just the microcosm of the entirety of Christ's life. At every point that he's tempted, he is and was successful, never giving into sin. He is uh, unblemished and perfect in his righteousness. And uh, let's just throw Peter in there. Um, he said that Jesus' sacrificial death was like that of a lamb, uh, without blemish or spot, uh, as the suffering servant. Um, Peter says that he, Jesus, uh, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And never even spoke a word a sinful word. Uh, His once for all time death was a sin substitute of the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus, a substitute for the unrighteous. The righteous is the designation for Jesus. He is a perfect spotless lamb. And um, it's this perfection of Jesus that believing sinners um, become possessors of through faith in him. Question, if Jesus sinned, would we want his righteousness or his works imputed to us? Well, no, because they would be imperfect. But the fact that, they, that, that he himself was perfect in every way and he uh, is, is righteous uh, we get his perfect righteousness imputed to our account. M- make, make note of that. We're going to come back to that just a little bit later, okay? Uh, one other thing to note is that in union with Christ, uh, Paul, Paul now turning to the second clause, um, God looks at his sinful people as possessors of his righteousness. Paul says in him, or so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. We might become the righteousness of God. Here Paul gives the result of or the purpose for why God made Jesus a substitute for our sin again so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, someone uh, might look at this word become and think that what Paul is saying is that God made or imputed our sin to Jesus' count so that we might be transformed into the righteousness of God. That is, that we might become like Christ in our daily living. And um, we should make no mistake about it that that is God's purpose for our life. At least that's one of the reasons why Jesus died for us, is not so that he could just save us from the eternal punishment of sin, but so that he could deliver us from the power of sin and transform us into the image of God, right? So that our daily lives would look like a reflection of our Savior. So, so God did, and we could, we could look at 2 Corinthians 3, which talks about us being transformed from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Okay? So God did um, save us through Jesus to make us look more like Jesus. But the question here is, is that what, what Paul is talking about? Okay? Well, um, in the first part of the verse, which we've already looked at, uh, it's about God considering Jesus to be our sin, right? Um, Jesus did not become our sin in the sense that he, um, he, he, he you know, uh, took on um, or rather uh, became a sinner in his practice. That's not what the first part of this is talking about. So it seemed that the second part of, of this um, verse right here would follow suit. It's, it's more about God reckoning something uh, to our account. All right? 
And, and also one other thing to, to make note of, if you look back at verse 19, I don't know if you have your copy of the scriptures in front of you, but in 2 Corinthians 5.19, uh, you see that Paul is dealing with an accounting. Okay, so, so in the context it's about God reckoning to uh, not count sinners' sins against them. And how he did not count their sins against them, well, verse 21 says by um, putting them on the cross. So God counts them to be on cross, on the cross of Christ. So my point in saying this is that if we're going to understand verse 21b, and that's what 21b is here, uh, in context, we have to see this word become as carrying the idea of made. Does that make sense? Not, not become in practice ourselves, but being made something, um, accounted as something, and of course in this case, accounted as the righteousness of God. Are you following me on that? Or did I just go, if I did, stop me, and I'll just do it all over again, but hopefully better. <laughs> okay, um, I want to give a quote here, and this sort of um, puts a bow on it. Uh, and really what it does what it does is show that this, this is right here the idea of, and we talked about this word last time, or this phrase, double imputation. You guys remember when we talked about that? Double imputation. Um, Murray Harris, in his commentary, says, uh, although the term legitimai, uh, which is reckoned or counted, uh, is not used in verse 21, but, but it's uh, in verse 19, which I just made reference to a second ago, it is not inappropriate to perceive in this verse a double imputation. Sin was reckoned to Christ's account, verse 21a, so that righteousness is reckoned to our account, verse 21b. As a result of God's imputing to Christ something that was extrinsic to him, that's outside him, namely sin, believers have something imputed to them that was extrinsic to them, namely righteousness. Okay, I think that's helpful. Uh, way to kind of put a ball on it. What we're seeing in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is this is a double imputation. Christ gets my sin and then I get his righteousness. Double imputation. And by, by God counting first my sin to Christ and his righteousness being counted to me. All right? You guys follow me on that? Okay, here's a here's a visual, all right? Or something to kind of visually represent this. Um, maybe you notice this, but this is all kind of accounting language. Do we have any accountants in here? Oh, man. It used to be a long time ago. Okay, so yeah, hey, bringing back some memories here, right? So we're going to talk about, th this is all accounting language, all right? So let, let's do a little accounting ledger, okay? And we're going to start with Jesus the Messiah, all right? So we're going to do the day, the account balance looks very much like a Something you you know you'd use a ledger for, right? So let's let's say um, the date is every moment of Jesus' life. Right? We're not going to give a specific date. Let's just say the whole life of Christ. All right? And let's let's say the account is his heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the person, okay, of a human, right? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now I'm not I'm not saying that we're four parts, or there's a big argument there about the parts of man. Is, is he two parts? Is he three parts? Is he four parts? Let's not get into that. Let's just say we're talking about a human here. All right? The account of, of his own life. And uh, we could say about the balance of his life, uh, we're kind of mixing metaphors maybe a little bit here, but let's just say 100%. All right? Um, his was a life of constant uh, credits, right, of righteousness. Okay? He, he never had to pull anything out of the account uh, uh, because of any unrighteousness on his part. So he's 100%. Um, let's do the accounting ledger of Matt Harkey. So this is, we'll just use myself as an example, okay? And let's just look first at um, every moment of Matt's life as an unbeliever, okay? Um, I, I, I say that because I'm a different person now. And God actually does care about my righteous deeds now, and they matter to him. But before becoming a believer, um, every moment of my life, and again, the account is the heart, soul, mind, and strength, yet yeah, you guessed it, I'm 100% indebted to God. Yes? 
So, so this is the actual life of both Jesus the Messiah and then my life, right? So, so let's, let's now look at double imputation. Um, again, the accounting ledger of Jesus the Messiah, but we're talking about imputation now. And the date is on the cross of Calvary, all right? So on the cross of Calvary, in heart, soul, mind, and strength, something happened so that God accounted to Jesus' account my sin, right? Now, in practice, in actual life, was Jesus a sinner? No, 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 never sinned. But God is accounting to the ledger of Christ my sin. And, of course, the accounting ledger of Matt Harkey, and we're going to say, at the initial moment of saving faith, because that's what the scripture says when we get imputed righteousness, right? In heart, soul, mind, and strength, you guessed it, I get the perfect righteousness of Christ. Right? Make sense? So double imputation. Jesus gets the penalty of my sin by reckoning, by imputation, I get his righteousness at the moment of saving faith. And guess what? I'm 100% clothed in his righteousness. Am I 50% clothed clothed in his righteousness? 100%. All of Christ imputed to my account. And that's the same for everybody, right? This is not just Matt Harkey. This is everyone who comes to faith in Christ. Repentant faith gets this imputation of Christ's righteousness. Now, I'm going to talk briefly because now having talked about imputation, and I think we've got a pretty solid... Um, biblical basis for imputation underneath our feet. There is a, a perspective out there I've mentioned already called the new perspective on Paul. Um, the new perspective on Paul, and by the way, it is a misnomer to call it the new perspective on Paul because in fact there are multiple new perspectives on Paul. Um, it, you could ask multiple individuals who uh, are in the stream of this new perspective on Paul, uh, what they believe about the new perspective, and you're going to get some differences from one person to another. Okay, just, just throwing that out there so that if you go and study it, um, you, you'll have that as some, as some knowledge. Uh, let me just say what the new perspective on Paul is saying is um, that the old perspective which they would say was the perspective of the reformers, was an inaccurate perspective, okay? And in particular, they would say that the reformers' conclusion that the scripture teaches imputation, that conclusion was inaccurate, okay? All right? And it's interesting because they will, they will say a lot of things that you could agree with. Uh, if, you, if you listen to a person who is of the new perspective persuasion, uh, they're going to say certain things like the, the Jewish people at Jesus' time, um, one of the main problems they had was um, just the, the identification markers that were part of being a Jew, like circumcision, dietary restrictions, these kind of things. The Sabbath, these things were kind of hang-ups Uh, for them to allow Gentiles to come into the covenant community. And if if you you look at the New Testament, you're going to see that there is that reality in the New Testament that those who were Jews and got converted to Christ, they struggled with these, how do we relate to one another as Jew and Gentile in the body of Christ? should, Should the Gentile be circumcised? Do we need to observe the Sabbath, the dietary restrictions? You'll notice that these kind of things that did mark a Jewish person were part of the, the conversations about what it meant to live in unity as Jew and Gentile. You guys follow me on that? Okay, and we could, we could wax very lengthy. I'm, I'm really using that word wax a lot tonight. It's just coming out. Um, but yeah, no, we, could, we could wax long about that and see a lot of things about the new perspective that are right. But what I want you to know is that the new perspective disagrees about the idea of imputation, okay? So as as far as, hey, what can I walk away with tonight? You just need to know that the new perspective disagrees about imputation. One such individual who is uh, the most influential teacher of the new perspective, you may have heard of this individual before. His name is N.T. Wright. Anybody heard of N.T. Wright before? Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. Pastor Ben has heard of N.T. Wright. 
you you will if you haven't heard of him yet you you will his influence is um, unmistakable but N.T. Wright as an individual very articulate very um, very smart a scholar uh, of the New Testament has written multiple books very very big fat books and very small popular books he's covered the gamut um, but what N.T. Wright says about justification uh, is that he does not believe what the Protestant reformers taught about justification. In other words, he does not believe in this idea of the imputation of Christ's righteousness by faith. And I'll just, I, I won't put words into his mouth. I'll just let you read what he says. If Paul uses the language of the law court, it makes no sense whatever to say that the judge imputes, imparts, bequeaths, conveys, or otherwise transfers his righteousness either to the plaintiff or the defendant. So, so in N.T. Wright's mind, if you think about a law court, uh, just generally speaking, thinking about a law court, it, it, it's never the case in our human experience that a judge would bequeath or impute to the plaintiff or the defendant somebody else, else's righteousness, right? And, and in the human court, that would be wrong to do, right? It, to, to let someone off the hook um, w without some kind of punishment. Okay, that, that, that could very well be a problem that we have. Um, but there's a couple, couple things to, to note here. The first one's very clearly, N.T. Wright does not believe, believe in imputation. Do you see that? He does not agree with imputation. Um, he says it makes no sense whatsoever about imputation. Just, just a response here to this. My problem with this is that, number one, a figure of speech doesn't have to walk on all fours. You know what I mean by that? Like... If you use a metaphor or something or an analogy, it doesn't have to fit, you know, every single, like, you know, implication of it. Um, Jesus in his parables, you know, when Jesus tells a parable, we don't have to make connection with everything that he says, right? We just have to understand what, what's the emphasis of what he's saying, right, Pastor Ben? We don't make a connection when we read Jesus' parables just about every single thing. You can get into a lot of trouble if you try to make a connection with everything in a parable that Jesus teaches. Uh, figures of speech, um, metaphors, these kind of things don't have to walk on all four, number one. And, and the other thing to say is, if God uses a metaphor or an analogy in a certain way, and if his word says in this law courtroom that we get imputed to our account Christ's righteousness, we ju just believe what it says, right? even if that's not normally the case of a human courtroom. In the divine courtroom, he has set it up so that Christ's righteousness gets imputed to our account. You guys follow me on that? Just offering a couple of responses um, to, to, to the point that N.T. Wright makes. Um, I want to look at a passage here that's really significant we haven't looked at yet. Um, this is the Apostle Paul talking about his own... Um, view of righteousness for his own life obviously he's he's developed the doctrine generally for for everybody but notice what he says about his own life indeed i count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake i've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that i may gain christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So, so just a question here. What for God is the Apostle Paul depending on as the basis for his acceptance before God? Christ. And, and who, who is he not depending on? Himself. Okay, note about this. This is Paul post-conversion, okay? And I've read some commentaries, and the commentaries, um, one commentary in particular that I, I agree with is recognizing that, that Paul is hoping as he stands before God in the future that the righteousness that he is depending on to be accepted for, before God is first and foremost the righteousness of Christ, not his own righteousness, okay? And I think, that, I think that's fair to say. There's some, there's some caveats to make about that, um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit in terms of the righteousness that comes from our life now that we are 
um, uh, positionally in Christ, all that matters. And we'll, we'll, we'll mention that a little bit more. But I want to just note that Paul is relying not on his own righteousness before God, but a righteousness that is given to him from God. And notice this word right here, um, this word rubbish. If you look back in the context, Paul is talking about how he is a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? Um, he is of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says, he, he even says this, he says, as, um, as to uh, righteous, or as to um, a righteousness is found in the law, he, he calls himself what? Blameless. So he thought of himself before coming to Christ as, as blameless. So he, he would have considered his relationship to God and the basis of it, his own righteousness. As to the law, that's exactly right. And uh, just, just make a note here if you want. Luke 18 in the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. Jesus, he tells that parable because um, there were people, it says this, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Okay? So that's why, the, that, that's why the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector was told, because there were people who were trusting in their own self-righteousness. Okay? So, so that was Paul, trusting in his own self-righteousness as the basis for his relationship with God. And then, of course, he got converted, and his perspective is different now, right? All of that former self-righteousness is what? Rubbish. And that's a very strong word, by the way, in the Greek. Okay? It's trash. Yeah? Worse than trash. Um, he considers all of that that he sort of gained on his own as just trash for the purpose of gaining Christ and being found in him. And while we don't have imputed righteousness here, we do have being found in him. And if you're found in Christ and you're united to him, whose, Christ, uh, whose righteousness do you have? You have Christ's. So clearly Paul would be saying, I'm relying upon the righteousness that's been given to me, a righteousness that comes from God, i.e. the righteousness of Christ. Yeah? So um, this is a passage that would totally go against, in my opinion, the uh, perspective that is the new perspective of Paul that denies the imputation of Christ's righteousness. And of course, all the other passages that we looked at as well would certainly argue against the new perspective on Paul. Realize that's just scratching the surface. There's much more to say about the new perspective. I could get you some resources on it if you'd like it, if you want to study it more. Um, just be f at least a little bit familiar with it in the day's ahead. Things like that. Um, okay. We're at 750. So does James contradict Paul? No, and there's this passage and this one and this one and these right here. And to summarize, Paul and James are two brothers who stand together in the battle for true saving faith. They are not fighting against each other. They are two soldiers standing back to back fighting legalism and licentiousness. Um, that's a summary. And we'll have to come back to that next time we're together. We'll just kind of put a little bow on that next time. Uh, just a couple of applications here. The first one is, um, having looked at all this, we need to stand firmly on God's declaration uh, of us, of you as righteous on the sole basis of Christ's sacrificial death for your sins and the imputation of his righteousness to your account by faith. Uh, we need to stand on that. That's central to the gospel. You give that up, you give the gospel up. All right? It's that significant. Imputation is that important. Also, don't use your justification as an excuse for sinning. In fact, genuine faith won't continue in sin. And we were going to get to that if we would have more uh, thoroughly developed the, the James and Paul, two soldiers standing back to back. Um, true faith will produce works because genuine faith that justifies also leads to good works. That's the point that James is trying to make. He's combating licentiousness. Just the idea that you can be saved, but your life looks no different. New Testament knows nothing of that. James is fighting that battle, and Paul himself fights that battle in different places in his writings as well. True, genuine faith leads to uh, good works. Progressive sanctification. Okay, not perfection, but definitely there is fruit there if it is genuine faith. Amen? Okay, so we need to stand on imputation, not use justification as an excuse for sinning, but live righteously for 
our God who has saved us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for saving us, imputing to our accounts the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we would not be able to stand before you um, because apart from Christ, um, all our righteous deeds are filthy rags. Uh, it's all rubbish. But we have the imputed righteousness of Christ to our account. We have a new nature now. Um, and, and that new nature produces good works. It does produce a practical righteousness in our lives. Uh, we speak differently, we live differently, our interactions with people are different, and when we sin, we hate it. We, we, it's not us anymore. We're something new, and, and all those good things, those good fruits that come from our lives, that's not filthy anymore. Th th those things are precious in your sight. You receive our, our good works, not as the basis of our salvation, but just the good fruit that comes from our lives that you have changed. And so, Lord, I just pray that this, this week, um, and you know all the circumstances that will come into our lives, that you would find us faithfully standing firm on the truth of imputation and as well as standing firm on not using our justification as an excuse, but as the foundation for why it is that we would live a life pleasing to you because we are new. We have been uh, changed and we have Christ's righteousness and we are being, in con being conformed into that same degree of glory or glory from degree to degree. We pray these things in Christ's name and by the Spirit's power and everybody said, Amen.